Down on the farm, there may soon be no farmer, at least not in the sense we know it now. Look at this tractor, there's already no driver. And inside the factory, there may soon be no workers, not on the production line at least, replaced by super-efficient industrial robots already at work in Japan, for whom monotony, noise, and this month's pay claim are no problem whatsoever. And here's what's inside all those robots, what makes them buzz and hum and click, a small microprocessor. In the old days, and that's a mere 25 years ago, this is what a computer looked like. This is one of the very first, the old ACE computer. ACE stands for Automatic Computing Engine. It's now been retired to the Science Museum in London. Practically a room full of valves and wires and general gubbins. And all of that can now be reduced to something like this, a modern microprocessor. And the reason that all that can become this is largely because of these little things in here, the modern silicon chip. The chips, a development of the transistor, are the ultimate in miniaturization. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of circuits reduced to a pinhead. Join up the chips to make a microprocessor and put a few of them into a box and you have a highly complicated and sophisticated computer which is not only small but, and this is the cardinal point, cheap. Cheap because although the initial cost of setting up a plant to produce these microprocessors is enormous, once set up, such a plant mass produces them very cheaply. We've got used to computers, of course. They've been producing things like our bank statements and our gas and electricity and phone bills for years now. But these memory computers still need plenty of people to tell them what to do. But look at this, the hole in the wall cash dispenser at the bank. We're getting more and more used to them, but they do away with the need for a bank clerk. Imagine a bank simply full of these. Or this, the self-service and mini-computerized petrol station. One cashier controls the lot, which does away with the need for forecourt attendance. As microprocessors make computers cheaper and cheaper, the process of replacing men and women with machines, and women's jobs are especially vulnerable, will accelerate very rapidly. Some people are talking about the second industrial revolution, which is why Mr. Christopher of the Tax Men and Women's Union is determined to stir the TUC into action. It seems to me to be absolutely essential that people realize what are the implications of these um, both frightening and, and tremendously uh, 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 opportunity which is being offered by these new developments. You talk about so, unemployment. What sort of a figure do you have at the back of your mind? I think, I think basically it's, it's, it's almost limitless. I, if one was graphing it, I think there's some point in the 21st century when, for all practical purposes, very few people will need to work at all. And five or six millions, I think, at the turn of the century is, is, is not out of, out of reasonable expectation at all. This is how Mr. Christopher's 80,000 or so members work now, writing out our tax returns by hand since successive governments have dithered over computerizing the tax system. But this is how they might do it in the future, at computer terminals with perhaps one-tenth the number of tax inspectors. Already at this computerized secretarial service, one secretary can handle what six did before. Because typewriters don't need typists anymore when you hook them up to the new computers. Already warehouses don't need warehousemen. It's all done by computer. And eventually, cash registers at the supermarkets, which already hand the housewife a computer-generated grocery bill, will simply tell the warehouses when and where to send how much new stock. But here is where the greatest impact will come on the factory floor. Already in Italian and Japanese car factories, mini computerized robots are replacing men on the shop floor. Could this happen at British Leyland? Of course, the unions could try to stop such automation entirely, just as the old Luddites tried to wreck the new spinning and weaving machines of the early 19th century. But the unions are more sophisticated than that. They know that if we don't go for microprocessors, other nations will, and will therefore quickly outproduce us. One reason why the government has just sunk £100 million into the British microprocessor industry and has asked the think tank to look into the whole subject. So patterns of employment will change. One expert at Sussex University, Mr Ray Kernow, says bluntly, our whole concept of what constitutes work must be reassessed. 
We've got, Mr. Kerno says, to come to terms with a working week which 50 years hence might go like this. Couldn't we see a system whereby people regard it as a social responsibility to go to work, most of them be pushing buttons or humping machinery, just attending things when they go wrong, or just seeing that things are going right. There'd be little work for people, really creative work in that sense. In fact, people would probably be paying to do creative work in that way. But why should they work more than, I said today, is 40, 50 hours a week? Why shouldn't it be 10 hours a week? Spread however you like it on that. And the rest of the time spent in taking part in other activities, much of which, in fact, will in this transition period be caring for each other. Whether we like it or not, and whether or not we agree with Mr. Kerner's futuristic predictions, the fact is that microprocessors are already changing our traditional patterns of work. Those who study the subject increasingly say that there is no Luddite solution to this problem, that the best way of dealing with this second industrial revolution is to think about it, to talk about it, and to worry about it now. And that is what the TUC is being asked to do. Michael Brunson, News at 10, with the early morning rush to work in London.